Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. If you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, we're excited to welcome Dr. Rama Amara. Dr. Amara is a professor at the Emory Vaccine Center and the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Emory University School of Medicine. He is also a researcher at the Yerkes National Climate Research Center and an investigator at the Emory Center for AIDS Research. Dr. Amara received his doctorate in molecular biology and immunology from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. He completed his postdoctoral training in, in the Yerkes lab with Dr. Harriet Robinson. Dr. Amara is an expert in developing vaccines against infectious diseases. Currently, Dr. Amara's research is focused on understanding the pathogenesis and immune correlates for HIV AIDS with a major focus on the development of novel prophylactic vaccines and therapeutic approaches to control HIV AIDS. Dr. Amaro's laboratory develops novel HIV vaccines using combinations of DNA, modified vaccinia Ankara, and protein-based vaccine delivery platforms, um, and molecular adjuvants such as CD40 ligand and GMCSF. Dr. Amaro's laboratory also develops novel vaccines that can be developed orally, such as Lactococcus lactis, a probiotic-based vaccine delivery and needle-free oral vaccination platform to induce mucosal immunity. He has played a major role in the preclinical development of AIDS vaccines that has completed phase 2A human clinical trials. Dr. Amar is also working with collaborators in India to develop an HIV vaccine that could be used to control AIDS on the Indian subcontinent where the strains of HIV that predominate differ from those that frequently are transmitted in the US and other Western countries. In addition to the development of preventative vaccines, Dr. Amar's laboratory develops approaches to treat HIV infection by combining PD-1 checkpoint blockade with therapeutic vaccination. At the onset of the pandemic in early 2020, Dr. Amara applied his vaccination development skills to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, which is currently being produced in India. He received a grant from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for this research. Welcome, Dr. Amara. Thank you so much for the uh, very kind introduction, uh, Dr. Sika. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to share some of the uh, work that we are doing in the HIV space uh, with the uh, cancer community, uh, because there are you know, a lot of parallels uh, between the two fields uh, that uh, we could uh, actually learn from each other and uh, apply. Uh, to both fields. So I'm uh, very uh, fortunate for this opportunity. Um, so this is my conflict of interest statement for this uh, talk that I'm a co-inventor of PD-1 technology that has been licensed to Genentech uh, by Emory University. Uh, before I go forward, I would like to uh, say that uh, all the work that uh, I'm going to present today uh, is done with uh, very close collaboration with uh, Rafi Ahmed's lab uh, at Emory University. Uh, so uh, this has been a, a wonderful uh, 15 or 15 years of collaboration. Um, briefly, the HIV is still a global health problem. Uh, nearly 33 million infected people are there worldwide. The majority of the infections are in the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there are a lot of infections in India and then other parts of the world. Uh, the solution for this is uh, the vaccine or we should be able to treat infected people. So before I go into uh, the details, I want to quickly introduce uh, what are the different phases that happen uh, during HIV or SIV infection in the macaques. Uh, in, after infection, there is a quick rise in viremia. Uh, after, within a few weeks, and then the virus establishes a set point viral load. So this is the acute phase, and, and then once it establishes a set point phase, it will go into the chronic phase, and then uh, the virus is maintained at that level for a long time uh, until uh, the time of uh, development of AIDS, uh, at which that the virus load increases, and then the 
um, an individual progresses to disease. And what the virus infects the CD4 T cells. Uh, so you see a rapid decline of CD4 T cells in the blood. Uh, and then there, there is a partial recovery. And then after that, there is a slow decline. And uh, once the CD4 T cells drop below 200 uh, cells per microliter blood or so, uh, you start seeing development of the AIDS. Uh, what is the hallmark of the infection is what, uh, what happens in the gut. Uh, so here you see there is a, a huge depletion of CD4 T cells, about greater than 90% of the T cells in the gut are uh, depleted within a few weeks after infection, uh, which is, uh, as, as you know, that uh, about 80% of the total CD4 T cells in your body are in the gastrointestinal tract. And then when you see a loss of 90% of them are being lost in a few, few weeks, which is very profound. And then the, unfortunately, these never recover uh, from there. Uh, even after antiretroviral therapy, there will be a partial recovery. So the time to progression disease is regulated by multiple factors such as plasma viral load, levels of CD4, memory B cells, and then hyperimmune activation. I wanted to put some of our work in the context and highlight what all the virus does. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, there is a lot of other people contributed uh, and because of the space, I'm not putting all those uh, references here. So we have shown that the memory B cells, although they are not infected by the virus, they are lost and then they play a significant role in, uh, in regulating this uh, pathogenesis to the virus. And then uh, we also showed that there is a loss of uh, TH17 cells um, because the virus infects them and depletes them. And then as well as TC17 cells, uh, the CD8 T cells producing IL-17, there is a role for regulating hyperimmune activation. And then we also showed that the PDCs played an important, a very important role in regulating the hyperimmune activation. And uh, while all this is happening, the virus, uh, the, bar, the host induces CD8 T cell response, but that comes at a low level and uh, late uh, as a result, uh, the CD8 T cells uh, are less functional against the virus. And then there is a slow decline of the CD8 T cells in the blood. And then all those CD8 T cells that are uh, uh, present uh, are exhausted, uh, means less functional. And then there is a, that's where I'll be uh, focusing on today, how to make the CD8 T cells more functional uh, during chronic infection. And then in addition to these, the virus, uh, although depletes CD4 T regs, it induces this CD8 T regulatory phenotype on the, among the CD8 T cells. These are uh, kind of a unique population of CD8 T regs that can actually suppress the function of these CD8 T cells. So a lot happens uh, right after uh, infection. So uh, it is very important to really treat the infected individual uh, with antiretroviral therapy uh, as soon as possible. So this is an example of what happens to the gut, the CD4 T cells in the gut. You can see this in the, in the HIV negative individual, all these lymphoid follicles, uh, aggregates that have one of CD4 T cells as shown here in the, in, the, in the gray or brown, whereas in the HIV infected person, you know, the, all those are, most of those are gone. So the consequences of the CD4 loss in the gut is that the depletion of TH17 cells causes the uh, permeability defect in the permeability barrier function of the gut. Uh, that leads to an increased microbial translocation and loss of control of infections leads to hyperimmune activation. Uh, the hyperimmune activation, more targets for virus replication, strong association with uh, disease progression. So we, fortunately we do have these antiretroviral uh, drugs uh, that are highly effective. Uh, Emery all actually played a great role in developing these, these drugs early on. And then there is a nice suppression of the virus, and then you can keep the virus suppressed at that level for a long time. However, the unfortunate thing is that the moment you discontinue antiretroviral therapy, virus uh, rebounds pretty quickly. Uh, that is because of the reservoirs that the virus establishes. Um, before I go into the reservoirs, I, I wanted to show that uh, the diversity of HIV is a huge problem. Here, you see that the diversity of uh, in global influenza in 1996, and then this is the diversity of the virus HIV in an individual six years after infection. 
and this is the diversity in uh, a cohort in Amsterdam in 1991. Now, if you see the diversity of HIV in Congo in 1997, this is huge compared to what you think about influenza. That, that is a major problem for uh, therapies as well as uh, uh, vaccines for HIV. And the <clears throat> other major barrier for HIV cure is that HIV integrates into the host genome and establishes the viral reservoirs. Here is, once it infects the CD4 T cells, uh, the productively infected cells are short-lived and they die after, sometime after. Uh, however, the latently infected cells uh, are the viral reservoirs are long-lived. And studies have shown that these have a half-life of um, uh, 44 months, uh, which means that uh, the time to eradication uh, of the reservoirs uh, is greater than 70 years under antiretroviral therapy. So this is basically uh, the life or more than life of an individual. So uh, persist the, these are the these persistent reservoirs uh, lead to the rapid viral rebound. Uh, they are established very early after infection, within days uh, of infection. And then there are in the field that there are two approaches people think about, the sterilizing cure versus functional cure. And in the sterilizing cure, there is a complete eradication of all HIV uh, uh, latently infected cells. Uh, as a result, uh, we would expect that the virus will not, there's no virus to rebound after art interruption. Whereas in the functional cure, you reduce the viral reservoirs under antiretroviral therapy that will lead to a lower viral rebound uh, after art interruption, and that will lead, and then the immune responses can take over and then uh, keep the virus under check. Um, so, uh, so far, people are only thinking about functional cure. I think sterilizing cure is a long way to go. Uh, even if the functional cure, there is more can be achieved uh, with the small effects. For example, a tenfold reduction in viral load uh, provides five to six years of longer life in the absence of an antiretroviral therapy. So a small effects can actually do a big things here. So the two major issues that need to be addressed um, to achieve a functional uh, cure. So generally people use this approach, kick and kill uh, approach to reduce viral reservoirs. So here you have exhausted CD8 T cells, you have latent viral reservoirs, you uh, need to use a kick approach where you activate the latent wires where that leads to reactivation of the latent wires and you generate these productively infected cells. And at the same time, if you uh, restore the CD8 T cell function, then you get these functional CD8 T cells. They can uh, hopefully kill these uh, reactivated uh, and productively infected cells. Um, so today I would uh, I'd like to give a brief uh, summary of our approach in targeting uh, PD-1 co-inhibitory pathway during chronic SIV infection and rhesus macaques. I'll uh, talk about the series of monkey studies we, we did to optimize the anti-PD-1 and treat, treat therapy, and then go into the synergy between PD-1 blockade and therapeutic vaccination. So, so to start with, the restoration of CD8 T cell function by targeting uh, PD-1 co-inhibitory pathway. These studies were done by uh, Vijay, Vijay Velu, who, uh, who is an independent investigator now at uh, Emory, but uh, these were done when he was with me in the lab. Um, so what is uh, PD-1 uh, pathway? So this is the PD-1 is a co-inhibitory receptor expressed on the T cells. And then it has two ligands, PDL1 and PDL2. Uh, the distribution of the PDL1 and L2 is different. Um, uh, irrespective of whether it binds to L1 or L2, that it will deliver a negative signal into the T cells. It will block the uh, T cell activation, uh, makes them, as well as it will also block the CD28 co-stimulation uh, that will lead to <clears throat> uh, less function or dysfunction of the T cell. And uh, way back, we showed that uh, when uh, after SIV infection in the macaques, if you look at the CD8 T cells induced after infection, at two weeks post-infection, they all express uh, PD-1, which is shown in gray here. Uh, the open, open histogram shows the PD-1 expression on the total CD8 cells. Whereas when you wait for uh, 12 weeks, uh, once the uh, infection goes into the chronic, uh, they still stay PD-1 positive, 
the MFI of the PD-1 per cell also increases, uh, which is actually shown here. Uh, that uh, the, this is the point uh, they actually become really exhausted. Um, so the the idea is that if you block this PD-1 pathway using an antibody uh, to PD-1 uh, that that disrupts this interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1, uh, then you can restore the function of the the T cell and uh, cytotoxicity, cytokines, and proliferation. So these, these studies are done um, way, way before uh, the PD-1 has actually become a, a popular therapy for uh, treating various cancers. Uh, it's just that the progress in the uh, HIV area is actually slow for, uh, for reasons that can be understandable. And uh, during those days, initially, these, this was uh, shown by uh, Rafi's lab uh, using the LCMV model that uh, you can block PD-1 and improve T cell proliferation function and reduce virus replication. And then soon after that, a um, uh, few labs have shown, um, including um, uh, Rafiq Sikali's lab, who, who is actually at Emory, uh, using in vitro studies in, from using cells from HIV infected people. Uh, showed that uh, you can actually block uh, PD-1 and then restore T cell proliferation and function. And then we showed using the chronic SIV infection model that uh, uh, PD-1 blockade will lead to T cell proliferation and function and virus replication. I'll quickly review this data. Uh, what we showed was that we took the animals that were infected for uh, almost a year and a half and then come in with uh, anti-PD-1 uh, antibody uh, on days uh, 0, 3, 7, 10, and 14. This is the short treatment because this was a chimeric of antibody of the mouse and the human. The antibody gets depleted um, soon after, uh, within after two weeks or so, because the animals uh, develop this anti uh, drug antibodies. Um, so, what we showed was that there is a functional restoration of CD8 T cells. The moment you start anti PD1 uh, therapy, that there is a very high proliferation of these uh, virus-specific CD8 T cells, which is also shown here. This, uh, we saw that in uh, three out of the four animals. And then the virus escaped from this epitope in that one animal, that's why the expansion is less. And then the, the proliferation marker goes up and the co-stimulation marker increases. And then we also showed that there is a functional restoration of uh, T cells in terms of cytokine co-production. Uh, before uh, PD-1 blockade, the majority of the cells were making only interferon gamma. After PD-1 blockade, that they make uh, interferon gamma, IL-2, as well as TNF alpha. So these are polyfunctional cells. Um, and uh, there was uh, a, a transient decline uh, in the viral load after PD-1 blockade, and then that that effect we we lost because that the antibody was depleted uh, from the system and then the virus comes back up. What was actually interesting to us was that although the virus uh, came back to the pre-blockade levels, uh, these animals survived for a very long time. I think this we extended this to almost a year. Um, and then uh, that was very uh, in, uh, interesting and intriguing to us. And then when we did further studies and then what we showed was that uh, PD-1 blockade, in addition to restoring T cell function, also decreased the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine expression, uh, ISGs, interferon stimulatory gene expression went down, hyperimmune activation went down. That resulted, that was associated with um, uh, improved uh, gut permeability barrier function, uh, and then less translocation of these uh, antimicrobial products uh, into the systemic compartment. So because of that, that, that really helped to prolong the uh, life of these uh, PD-1 treated animals. So with these encouraging results, we did a second study where we asked the question, can we combine PD-1 blockade with antiretroviral therapy? So these studies were done by uh, students in the lab, uh, Gita Mailvaganam and uh, Lynette uh, Chia. So before we go into this, we need to understand where the viral reservoirs are. Uh, the viral reservoirs are present uh, everywhere in the body, and uh, they are more in the PD-1 high cells than PD-1 low cells. This is the human data, and then here is the data from the macaques. And the other important thing to uh, keep in mind is that under antiretroviral therapy, 
there is a lot of virus uh, infected cells uh, in the germinal centers in these T follicular helper cells. So any approaches that we try to generate uh, should uh, be able to induce the CD8 T cells uh, that uh, have a, a homing capability to migrate to the B cell zone and then clear these uh, virus infected cells. So which means that these cells should acquire the expression of CXCR5 and then we showed that uh, early on that uh, uh, it is possible to generate those CD8 T cells that express this follicular homing potential. And um, later on, I'll be asking the question that whether can, that can be done using uh, a, a in, in the vaccination setting. So, um, and the other uh, thing that was expected with the uh, PD1 blockade uh, is that maybe PD1 blockade will release the virus out of the latency because it is uh, hypothesized that uh, you need these tra transcription factors uh, to really drive the virus out of the latency. In the PD1 positive cell, uh, this NF kappa B pathway is uh, inhibited because of the PD1 signaling, and then that actually keeps the virus in the, in the latent phase. Once you block the PD1, there is a possibility uh, that you can uh, reverse that latency and then the virus comes out. So the whole overall uh, model was that when you do the PD-1 blockade that you have the virus uh, possibly released from the latently infected cells and it will uh, release, it will um, reverse the exhaustion of the CD8 T cells and PD-1 blockade also has an effect on uh, activated B cells that we have shown in another publication and then these work, in, uh, work together to basically reduce the viral reservoirs. Um, so to address this, we designed a monkey study where we took the uh, chronically infected monkeys and then conducted PD-1 blockade in two phases. In the first phase, uh, we, uh, we did the PD-1 blockade for uh, five doses over 10 days, just like in our chronic phase. Uh, to restore CD8 T cell function and enhance viral suppression. And then on day 10, we initiated antiretroviral therapy so that we can suppress the virus. So the idea was that these uh, improved CD8 T cell responses will work uh, with the antiretroviral therapy and will lead to rapid pull down of the virus. And then these CD8 T cells, and then the second phase, uh, we did the PD-1 blockade under antiretroviral therapy where the idea is whether it can restore CD8 T cell function and then the destabilize the viral reservoir and possible clearance by CD8 T cells. So if these two happens, then we anticipated that there will be a better control of re-emerging viremia after antiretroviral therapy. So this was the study design. And then we had basically two groups of monkeys. Uh, one group received PD-1 blockade uh, of uh, 10 animals and one group received uh, saline. And then, uh, so I don't want to go into this. And uh, this, for this purpose, we developed this uh, uh, in, in collaboration with Gordon Freeman that uh, we developed an antibody that is primatized so that we could uh, repeatedly give in, in these animals. Uh, first, looking at the first phase one, you can see uh, as, as soon as you start this PD-1 blockade, there is a profound proliferation of uh, CD8 T cells as well as CD4 T cells as well as CD8 T cells that happens in the blood. Once you initiate under 12 therapy, this proliferation goes down. And uh, we also uh, showed that there is an increase in SIV specific CD4 uh, interferon gamma and TNF positive CD4 T cells as well as CD8 T cells uh, that increase after PD1 blockade. And you see the functional restoration based on the Grand and B expression as well as CCR5 uh, in the PD1 treated animals before and after uh, PD1 blockade. And then, um, as we observed in the previous uh, study, that there is a, a prof nice induction of these uh, genes associated with T cell activation and cell cycle. At the same time, uh, genes associated with uh, ISGs. Uh, type 1 interferon response were and inflammation were downregulated following the PD1 blockade, which is a, an important thing for uh, HIV cure approach. Um, and we saw a, a much faster uh, decline of the virus after initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Uh, in this uh, Kaplan Meyer show curve, we show that uh, normally it takes about 150 days or longer to 
bring the viral load down uh, below the level of detection after the initiation of antiretroviral therapy. If you had PD-1 blockade plus ART, that you can achieve this uh, under 50 days. Um, this is the viral load for the individual animals. Um, so going on to phase two, uh, here we spaced, we used a higher dose of the antibody. Uh, we went to 10 milligram per kg. Uh, at the same time, we ch changed the interval to uh, every month. Uh, we gave three doses uh, after the virus was completely suppressed. And then when we looked at uh, viral, and, um, if there was any evidence for the viral you know, uh, reactivation, and we did see some, uh, there, there are blips of virus. Remember again, uh, at this point, the animals are still under antiretroviral therapy. Uh, even then we saw some uh, blips that are happening uh, in the viremia uh, in the PD-1 treated animals. In the saline treated animals, these were mostly, uh, except for two episodes, they're, they're not there. So this suggested that there may be some reactivation of the latent virus with PD-1 blockade and the antiretroviral therapy. And then in terms of the uh, gene expression, RNA uh, profile that uh, we saw a different profile in the sense there is better T cell activation. And then there's also some induction of uh, interferon response. Um, so this is to note that at this point that the overall the ISG levels have gone down quite a bit. So because of the PDM blockade, there is a small increase after that. Um, importantly, the PD1 treated animals showed less uh, reactable, reactivatable virus, viral reservoirs. Uh, this is using an in vitro assay um, that showed that the PD-1 blockade reduced the viral reservoirs. And then when we did the P, uh, interruption of the therapy, so uh, there was a viral rebound in all animals. Uh, however, in the PD-1 treated animals, we had some animals that showed uh, some control of the virus uh, and about half of the animals and the half of the animals uh, were non-controllers. So the way we measure this is that the virus always, uh, this is the set point viral load prior to initiation of ART. Uh, and then when we see the rebound, we always compare that to uh, the set point viral loads and set points post ATI to the viral load uh, at the uh, initiation of ART. So you, you can see that the virus always comes back to the you know, same levels. Uh, whereas here in some animals, uh, there was a, a reduction in set point viral load, which is actually quantitated here that uh, uh, these are the control animals. They're under fourfold uh, uh, of their pre arc set point viral load, whereas in the P some of the PD-1 uh, treated animals, uh, there was anywhere from six to eight fold lower set point. So there was some benefit to PD-1 blockade uh, in this setting. So overall, these are all the things that PD-1 blockade did under antiretroviral therapy. Um, uh, it improved the antiviral immune function. Uh, there was better con viral control after ATI. It increased the CXCR5 positive, Danzen B positive, Tefran positive CD8 T cells. I have not shown all these data. So it uh, increased also uh, TH17's uh, reconstitution in the gut, uh, whereas um, the viral reservoir decreased, type of interferon response decreased, and immune activation decreased. So this um, suggested to us that PD-1 blockade in tandem with other therapeutic interventions and latency reversing drugs may provide additional benefit. So one thing that we did not observe in, in this uh, study was that when we treated with PD-1 blockade under antiretroviral therapy, there was no real um, significant increase in the uh, frequency of SIV specific CD8 T cells. So to address that, that we started another study where we combined the PD-1 blockade uh, with uh, therapeutic vaccination. So this study is uh, still under review that uh, this is uh, done by two postdocs in the lab that um, uh, Abdul Sheikh Rahman and uh, Brugu Yagi. Um, so the goal for this study was that can we induce a strong and broad uh, highly functional CD4 and CD8 T cell response by vaccination of chronically SIV infected rhesus macaques under ART. Thus, combining PD1 blockade with vaccination enhance the function of vaccine induced T support T cell response and will the enhanced T cell immunity reduce viral reservoirs and provide therapeutic benefit following ART interruption. So, for this, we used 
uh, a DNA prime MVA uh, boost vaccine. This is MVA's modified vaccine in Ankara. So we developed this vaccine for uh, preventive uh, therapy um, uh, for HIV, and then this vaccine has completed phase 2A studies in humans. Um, and then we adjuvanted this vaccine with the uh, CD40 ligand. Um, I'm not going into those details. Uh, that CD40 ligand is displayed on a virus-like particle that would provide a strong co-stimulation. Uh, and the MVA, because it's a live attenuated virus, it doesn't need any uh, adjuvant. So using this uh, vaccine that we designed a monkey study where uh, we used either six or seven animals, and one group received, uh, they're all infected with SIV MAC239, which is, this is a super hot virus. It induces it establishes a very high set point. Uh, set point, uh, it's about 10 to the six, six copies, which is about 100 fold higher than what you normally see with HIV in humans. So we are setting a very high uh, bar here. And then we initiated antiretroviral therapy about 10 weeks after infection. Uh, and then other group uh, received uh, DNA prime and MVA boost vaccine. Uh, DNA is adjuvanted with CD40 ligand. And we also used imicomod, which is a TLR7 agonist, um, as an adjuvant during the uh, DNA primes. Um, and we also used imicomod after the MVA boost, uh, not along with the MVA boost, it's a two weeks after each MVA boost. Uh, this is to see if we can use the imicomod as a latency reversal agent to kick the virus out of these latently infected cells. And then the third group received the DNA an MVA vaccine in addition also received PD-1 blockade uh, prior to initiation of ART as well as uh, during uh, DNA vaccinations. So what we uh, found was that there was a strong anti-drug antibody uh, that occurred uh, during this PD-1 blockade. Uh, as a result, we, we stopped PD-1 blockade only on, so after the DNA second DNA vaccination Otherwise, as our initial intent was to continue the PD-1 blockade uh, during MVA vaccinations as well. So that was an unfortunate thing that uh, we could not uh, do that in the study. So here is uh, what is happening to the CD8 T cells. Uh, this is the selected uh, monkeys that express this MAMU AO1 uh, MHC haplotype. We had uh, uh, two uh, monkeys in each uh, vaccine group and one monkey in the control group. This shows you what is the expansion of CD8 T cells. Um, as you can see that uh, the blue is the no uh, vaccine only and the red is vaccine plus PD-1. Uh, while there was no real difference in the expansion of the CD8 T cells, but vaccination induced a robust uh, increase in the frequency of CD8 T cells, specifically SIV after each MVA boost. In some monkeys, there were uh, close to 15% of the total CD8 T cells that were specific to that. So this highlights that the vaccination um, was doing, uh, uh, inducing pretty strong CD8 T cell response. Uh, this is one thing that we saw with PD-1 blockade, there was a profound increase in cells that are expressing perforin and granzyme B. Uh, and that uh, happened uh, even right after the DNA1 vaccination and then these CD8 T cells were actually maintained at that level uh, until the time of uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, interruption. Uh, that was not observed uh, that, that well in the vaccination without uh, PD-1 blockade. And then <clears throat> we, to understand the T cell response in all animals, we did the intracellular cytokine assays uh, and measured the production of interferon gamma and TNF alpha following stimulation with peptide pools. And then we, you can see that the vaccination induced uh, again after the MVA boost uh, more profoundly that the induction of strong uh, CD4 T cell responses in both uh, with and without PD1. Uh, but the, in general, the effects after the first MVA were actually higher in without PD1 blockade on the CD4s. Uh, however, we, all, they, they all, we also saw an increase for interferon gamma and TNF alpha co-production uh, by these cells on the CD4s. And then uh, importantly that we saw there is a, a profound increase of CD8 T cell responses uh, in both uh, vaccine groups uh, with and without PD-1 blockade. Uh, one thing that I'm not showing here is that preferent granzyme B expression would be 
better for the PD1 treated animals. Uh, we couldn't measure that uh, in the intracellular cytokine assay. Uh, so this is compared to the controls. The, these these effects are profound. And again, uh, the, when you look at the CD8 T cells co-producing interferon gamma and TNF alpha, they are also very high uh, in the vaccinated animals compared to the uh, R2 only controls. Um, then we wanted to see uh, whether the vaccination changed any breadth of uh, uh, SIV specific uh, T cell response. So to do that, we um, stimulated cells using peptide pools. Uh, so we made uh, total 225 envelope peptides. These are 15 mars overlapping by 11. Uh, these uh, 225 peptides were divided into 12 pools. Similarly, we divided this GAG uh, 125 peptides into uh, 12 pools. Uh, and then measured the immune response against each of these pools. And then the, here is the each monkey. Uh, you can see that in the absence of vaccination, there is very little breadth uh, that you see uh, for the CD4 T cell response. However, when we give the vaccine, uh, we see a very nice increase in the breadth. Again, for the CD4 breadth, uh, that seems to be higher uh, in the vaccine only group compared to the vaccine plus PD1, uh, but they were not statistically significantly different. Uh, we, similarly, we saw a, an increase in the breadth for the CD8 T cell response uh, on an average. Uh, you can see anywhere from uh, 4 to 12 uh, pools were responding uh, in the vaccine only group and a little bit lower in the vaccine plus PD1 group. Uh, so at this point, it looked like that there was a, not a big benefit of PD1 blockade combining with the vaccination. Uh, except for there was an increase in profound increase in the granzyme B and perforin positive CD8 T cells, but the vaccination did well in uh, both groups. Um, this is the looking at what is happening in the lymph nodes and then uh, using this in situ uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, uh, Abdul showed that uh, the T cells are there, CD8 T cells are there both in the T cell zone uh, as well as in the B cell follicles and germinal centers. Uh, this is the CD8. Uh, this is a, a zoomed up image of the T cells on the, uh, the CD8 and the express granzyme B. And this is the co staining of CD8 and granzyme B, which can also be seen even in the germinal centers. Um, so that shows that the PD1 blockade, uh, the vaccination induced uh, CD8 T cells, not just in the T cell zone, also in the B cell zone, as well as including germinal centers which is very uh, important finding. And then we confirmed that uh, these cells that are there in the B cell follicles are indeed antigen specific. Here is in some animals where in the mammal on positive animals that we uh, stain for the GAG CM9 tetramer, uh, and then the granzyme B, you can see that they're co-staining co both in the T cell zone as well as in the B cell follicle. So this was, uh, again, there was no real difference between the uh, PD with and without PD1 blockade, but the vaccination uh, itself uh, induced a uh, pretty uh, strong uh, T cell response. Um, this was encouraging. So when uh, we did the uh, treatment interruption, um, we saw some effects of PD-1 blockade. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the vaccine only, that again, you always compare the viral rebound to the pre-art uh, set point viral loads uh, in, the, in the controls that are all except one animal. Uh, kind of reach the pre set point wire load uh, pretty quickly within a few weeks. And the same thing happened uh, in most of the vaccine-only animals. Uh, however, in the PD-1 treated animals, these have relatively higher set point wire load uh, prior to initiation of ART. Even then, uh, we saw there was a slower rebound of uh, viremia, and uh, this, the, it is quantitated here. So this is the difference in the area under the curve post uh, ATI uh, pre-art set point versus post-art uh, uh, set point. Uh, the higher the value is, the better uh, viral control post ATI. You can see uh, up to 10 weeks or 16 weeks or 26 weeks that there is better viral control in the PD-1 vaccine plus PD-1 treated animals. And then there are three animals in the vaccine only group did well and that the other uh, three did not do that well. Um, 
So this was encouraging, but as I said, this, this is a, the bar is very high, you know, seeing this kind of set point viral loads is, uh, you don't see that in humans. In humans, you generally see around 10 to the four copies. So, um, and then uh, what was interesting to us was in the B in the both in the T cell zone and B cell follicles, when they look at the uh, CD8 T cells that are expressing granzyme B, they were uh, higher in the PD1 vaccine plus PD1 treated group, but not in the uh, vaccine only group. And similarly, we also saw preservation of breath. Uh, this is the breath that was induced after vaccination. I'm showing this again. But when we looked at the breath after uh, heart interruption, uh, this was actually maintained uh, in the PD1 plus vaccine group, uh, but not in the vaccine only group. So PD1 is certainly doing something to preserve the function of um, <clears throat> function and the T cell breath uh, in these uh, treated animals, and that was contributing to better viral control post uh, uh, art interruption. So these are the conclusions for this this part of the vaccine plus PD1. Overall, we saw the vaccine is inducing a robust and the broad CD4 and CD8 T cell response, and the PD1 blockade mainly affected the granzyme and perforin expression on the CD8 T cells uh, during vaccination phase. And there was also a, a decrease in the viral reservoirs in the PD-1 group, not in the other two groups, which uh, are not shown here. Um, and that was associated with this. there was some delay in the viral rebound and the lower set points in the vaccine plus uh, PD-1 combination group. Uh, that viral uh, better viral control was associated with uh, preservation of CD8 T cell function and the breath in you know, the PD1 group. So um, there are more more experiments need to be done that uh, the future studies are looking at uh, vaccination combined with uh, latency reversal agent and PD1 blockade, and then uh, using PD1 blockade at uh, other time points and other points of uh, uh, other time points of infection. So with that, uh, this is uh, the people in other people in my lab, and I've already acknowledged all the people that contributed uh, uh, as as I went along. Uh, and I'd like to thank um, Rafi Ahmed uh, and uh, Gordon Freeman. Uh, Gordon Freeman provided this anti PD one antibody. Uh, this this has been a, a wonderful collaboration for over fifteen years. And then various uh, cores and, and facilities at Yerkes uh, and Emory. And then uh, the, part, in the early part of the studies, we received the antiretroviral therapy drugs from the Gileads. And uh, we thank for, for that and the funding from NIH. Uh, I'll stop here and happy to take any questions. Oh, thanks, Dr. Amara. That was a fantastic talk. I, I always love learning about uh, about fundamental immunology. You know, it's it's awesome, um, and Thank the you. studies that you've you've, you've illustrated, in, especially in the animals. There are a couple of questions in the question and answer chat. Um, one is from Dr. Waller. He said it was a great talk, and his question is: Is there a suggestion that anti PD one antibody therapy during vaccination? may be less effective than expected due to increased activation induced cell death in antigen specific T cells? Yeah, that's I think a very important question. We uh, we debated quite a bit about exactly when to initiate PD-1 blockade during vaccination, whether we should wait uh, the T cells to expand and then to initiate the blockade versus uh, the day zero of vaccination. And then Rafi's uh, had generated some data in the mouse that in the acute infection, when you initiate PD-1 blockade with uh, vaccine, with the infection, there was an increase in the CD8 T cell response. Um, and unfortunately, we couldn't say much because uh, these animals uh, develop this anti-drug antibody, maybe because of a combination of CD40 ligand and uh, imicomod, maybe acted as an adjuvant and then just that spurred a lot of response to the uh, the antibody itself. Uh, so I don't think uh, we can really answer that question uh, well from our study. Uh, if I'm going to redo it, I will not 
co-inject a vaccine and uh, PD-1, an anti-PD-1 antibody together. I would at least wait a few weeks. That's interesting, yeah. So, uh, you know, when Dr. Waller talks about activation in due cell death, um, I sometimes uh, think about the CD4 T cells in, in the, um, when PD-1 is blockaded. And I want to just ask you a naive question. I, uh, sure. What, what is the role of that? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there is, but we, we often focus on CD8 positive cells, but I was wondering, are the CD4 positive cells that are expanding during PD-1 blockade, are they mostly evolving to this TH17 phenotype or what, what exactly do they do um, in, in this response? So we don't, we look for the IL-17 expression and in general, we don't see much uh, SIV specific IL-17 positive cells, although there are a lot of IL-17 positive cells that are non-SIV specific, maybe really responding to the microbes or, and we haven't seen uh, much change even in the total IL-17 positive cells in the gut as well. Um, so that, uh, yeah, I don't think we were seeing anything uh, related to TH17, specific to, uh, specific to SIV for sure, uh, but even non SIV specific cells, there was not much change. Interesting, uh, and I have another question. Um, uh, it, it said, uh, in your earlier part, in your earlier part of the talk, when treated with PD-1 inhibitor and antiviral therapy in the animal model, it seems you treat the animals simultaneously. Um, Oh, this, this was kind of, actually, this question is similar to what Dr. Waller was talking about, I guess. But do you think any difference of the results if you treat the animals sequentially versus simultaneously? And it seems like you would probably maybe get different results. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then Dr. Ramalingam asked, uh, besides combination with vaccine, have any other combination approaches with PD-1 blockade demonstrated promise? Um, no, I, I don't think that, uh, oh, so uh, Mirko's lab has done a combination of PD-1 and the CTLA-4 blockade uh, under antiretroviral therapy, but not with vaccination. Uh, and then they saw a higher reactivation of um, the virus from the reservoirs when you have a dual blockade compared to PD-1 only or CTLA-4 only, uh, because there are a lot of uh, uh, CTLA-4 positive, positive cells also harbor viral reservoirs. Um, but they did not have any effect on the viral control after uh, antiretroviral therapy interruption. And then they also did not see an increase in the uh, function, frequency and function of SIV specific cells. Um, so it looks like that to increase the uh, SIV specific T cell immunity, you need something like vaccination. Um, so it's possible that now if you could take, do a, do a dual blockade with vaccination, that things may be different. Um, because we have seen that PD-1 blockade can also trigger the Tdex uh, going up and that could have an impact on the vaccine induced T cells. But again, that, that issue is with the tolerance, how much you can do in an SI, HIV infected person on antiretroviral therapy, uh, because it's very different from the cancer setting where the, you could take a little bit higher risk uh, because of the you know, benefit that you may have uh, in prolonging the life of the uh, uh, individual. Uh, so that's why it's, um, we have not really pushed forward in that direction uh, because the translation may become very hard. Interesting. So I was wondering, you know, there are some cancers where uh, we have a uh, high PD, PD-1, PD-L1 expression in the tumor, but there aren't a lot of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, in those, do you think that in those patients, you know, you would need to block PD-1. I mean, based on your vaccine studies, you would get a very good response just with vaccination. Yeah, so I think you still need to block PD-1 because although these CD8 T cells are induced, uh, they express, uh, they do express some level of PD-1. Uh, so when these T cells actually go to the tumor uh, and then they could receive that negative signal because the tumor is expressing the L1, right? So. Uh, it you need, you may need a combination of both. Oh. Huh. 
Interesting. Well, um, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. It was, it's a, it was a fantastic talk. Uh, and uh, I hope you got, you'll be able to collaborate with some of our researchers. Sure, I would love to, you know, work with anybody who, uh, who is interested in vaccination in, in the cancer setting. Uh, we are certainly open to uh, collaborating with people and then contributing to that field as well. Okay, great. Um, I forgot to read this. Uh, I, I was supposed to read um, that uh, um, to view all upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center, just a blurb for future things too. Sure. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Bye.